Hey, we're back already for another chat and draw and ask me anything uh, session because my last chat and draw didn't really show you much draw. I, uh, I had the camera set up to properly shoot everything at the top of my page, but when I went to do the edit, it edited at an aspect ratio that cropped off the entire top of the page. So you guys didn't really get to see me draw very much. I'm very embarrassed. Uh, but since the information in the video was good, you can just consider it a podcast with a really boring picture. So anyway, we're back to have a bit of drawing and a bit of talking. And as always, my Patreon patient, uh, pa uh, patrons are uh, welcome to post questions on the site and I will answer them here. Happy to answer any questions that you have. We've got a long list of really good ones. And good grief. Um, wow, what am I going to tackle today? Uh, yesterday I tackled how do you determine what projects to take on, but I completely skipped the part about how he, Glenn Mer Matchett that is, asked specifically about work for hire projects, which is an entirely different matter from the question I answered yesterday. Oops. Uh, work for hire is really, really different. Um, work for hire is for me about getting to work on classic characters I really love. Uh, when somebody offers you Wonder Woman, you just, you just want to do Wonder Woman. I mean, maybe not everybody has that reaction, but I absolutely love Wonder Woman and I would probably crawl across glass to get to draw her. Um... So I've made some unwise decisions <laughs> in the past about taking on Wonder Woman jobs, even when I wasn't necessarily in a good place to be taking on new work. And uh, page rates are not necessarily that great in, in work for hire. Uh, some of them are, are pretty good, but... Uh, the competition for work is high. Everybody wants these gigs. And the money that you're likely to make on a work for hire gig is going to be on uh, the original art sales. I mean, if you work on something like Wonder Woman, you'll probably make more money on the sale of the original art than you will on the assignment, or at least I do anyway. Um, uh, same goes for, for Marvel Comics. And that does in some ways influenced my decision about what jobs to take on because there are just some jobs that are going to be kind of obscure and they're really not going to uh, get much attention and they're on characters that maybe aren't as popular and you have to wonder is this gonna take time out of my schedule I really can't afford and is the page rate going to be high enough to take that kind of risk? And is the character uh, going to sell the art? And, and sometimes the answer is no. I mean, if you work on Batman, you'll, you'll be able to sell the art. You work on Captain Adam, maybe not as much. So there are some commercial considerations in there. Um, some creators get stupid money to work on mainstream comics. I, I, I find it puzzling because they don't seem to sell any better than anybody else does. <laughs> I guess they, they're buddies with the publishers. I mean, I don't, I don't really get it. But, um, but uh, when I've worked on books and the, the sales have gone up, uh, it didn't necessarily make that much difference in my page rate. But... What, what can you say? That's, that's, the, that's the way it is. Um, so emotionally, I take jobs with characters that I really care about. I, I, I've loved some of the jobs that I've gotten in the mainstream. I, I really loved working on um, Mutant X 2000. It was a vampire... Uh, X-Men story. I wasn't super keen on the inks. The inks were done <laughs> by the infamous Various and uh, of varying quality. And, and I knew that was going to happen. The book was um, 
uh, running really behind, uh, uh, not through any fault of mine. In fact, I, I was the one they brought in to bring it up to snuff, which um, doesn't usually happen. But I brought that one in, and I did some of the best superhero pencils I've ever done on that job because I was gunning for it. I really, really wanted that gig, and then it turned around and got canceled almost immediately after. So it had nothing to do with me. But um, uh, but I loved that book. I, th I was thrilled to do it. It was super fun. I love working on X-Men projects. I got to draw Storm and Gambit as uh, as vampires. I mean, who doesn't want that? <laughs> what fun that was. But um, but other jobs, you know, they'll offer me a, a story, and I'm like, ah, I don't know, maybe not so much. My heart's not in it. I just, I just feel great that I'm in a position now that I don't necessarily take on jobs if my heart isn't in it. Uh, because I know I won't do as good a job, and somebody else probably needs that job, and if I don't need it, somebody should just go ahead and, and have it over me. I, I don't need every job that comes my way, and of course I can't possibly take them all on. Uh, my, my time is finite, just like everybody else's, but 90% uh, of it is whether or not I like the character. I've, I've taken some pay cuts to work on uh, characters I really, really love. I mean, you know, if somebody came along and asked me to do Prince Valiant tomorrow, I'd, I'd jump at it. <laughs> it's a bucket list kind of job. Um, so, the big thing for me, what makes me take on a work for hire job? Uh, the character. Uh, if I'm, well, you know, it's there, there are a lot of other considerations depending on the gig, because when I think of work for hire, I generally think of mainstream comics and superheroes that I've loved since I was a kid. Work for hire gigs aren't always like that. I got offered a work for hire gig not too long ago. If you've been a long-term Patreon supporter, you remember this issue. Uh, I was offered a work for hire gig on a project that was in the public domain. They wanted me to work on an adaptation of something in the public domain and they wanted it to be work for hire. And the page rate wasn't that bad, but the rest of the contract was terrible. And I thought, criminy, this is, this is public domain. If I wanted to, to do this story, I could go do it. I could probably put together a, a Kickstarter or a or a GoFundMe or something, and or you know, Patreon, which I've already got, and and I could do it myself without having to sign this work for hire agreement. I, it was ludicrous to me. I was like, why would anybody take this gig? But uh, you know, they kept coming back with a contract deal that just seemed to get worse and worse every time I asked for a change, and it was obvious we were not going to come to an agreement. And that was not a bad decision because I ended up doing. Snow Glass Apples with Neil Gaiman instead. So if anything uh, will convince you to not take the job just because you th think something better won't come along, well, sometimes something better really, really does come along, and you will be sorry if you took that other gig. I, it, nobody can see into the future, but there is nothing more soul-killing than making a deal that you know is a really, really horrible, bad deal. And it's one of the reasons why I was so grateful to my my Patreon supporters, because I told them, I said, look, uh, if I didn't have the Patreon uh, paying uh, me a, a nice chunk of change every month, I, I might have had to take that job. And I didn't. And I was able to hold out for a few months and... And the contract for Snow Glass Apples came in, and uh, that was a great blessing. So, so thank you, Patreon patrons, or is it Patreon patrons? I don't really know. I don't care. Whatever works. Uh, I just dropped my pen. <laughs> oh, earthquake. Okay, so uh, work for hire gigs aren't just confined to mainstream comics. Uh, I can't tell you how many projects I've been offered that were offered to me as work for hire, for which there was no valid reason. Um, like I said, public domain stuff that they wanted me to adapt and no reason, no reason to offer me that kind of contract, but there you have it. 
so compensation and whether or not I want to do the gig because you know that you're probably not going to make very much in the long run. That's, that's not always the case. One of the most lucrative jobs I've done in my entire career has been just a few issues of Sandman. I, I, I don't even consider myself a primary artist on Sandman. I always find it kind of embarrassing when I'm included with people like Mike Drigenberg. But, um, but you know, there it is. People really love Sandman, and I appreciate being in, included with the more prominent and valuable artists. But um, uh, Sandman has paid very, very, very well. If, if I had done, say, I don't know, one entire story arc, I could probably live on that <laughs> the rest of my life. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's quite a quite a lucrative gig, but I didn't. I only did a few issues, so I, uh, I make a nice little chunk of change every year. And for um, many years, it, it paid my, my health insurance. It doesn't anymore. My health insurance is you know, super expensive. But, but for a long time, it was a really, really good gig for me, and I was glad to have it. I just realized I forgot this poor dude's sash on his big bulky sweater. You know he's a professor because only a professor guy would wear this kind of big bulky sweater. At least that's my thinking anyway. So, oops, I made a goof. As you can see, my pencils tend to be pretty rough on these pages. And uh, the advantage is that the art generator goes pretty fast and the disadvantage is I make stupid mistakes like that one. Oops. Anyway, uh, next question. What am I, what am I next question? I, I got a question here from Brett Gordon. Beyond completing a distant soil, what would be a dream project adaptation character you'd love to work on? Thanks for that question, Brett. I, I actually got that gig already. <laughs> I cannot tell you what it is, but, uh, I signed the contract not too long ago for a project and I'm not finished with the distant soil, which... <laughs> Kind of makes me feel a little bit guilty, but believe me, you you will not blame me when you find out what it is, and you won't find out for about a year. Uh, but it's it's truly uh, a bucket list project. Uh, as for other jobs, um, I've always wanted to work on Aquaman. I've always wanted to work on Batman. I mean, I have done a little bit of Batman and some Justice League comics, but I've never worked on his his title. I was so annoyed when. Bob Shrek was editor of the book. He promised me he'd get me a Batman gig, and then he didn't. Left the company. What a bummer. That was kind of disappointing. But uh, who knows? Maybe some other editor will come along and give me Batman. I'd like to do it for a, you know maybe a cool Poison Ivy story. That'd be awesome. I love Poison Ivy. Uh, Aquaman. I've always wanted to draw Aquaman. Aquaman was you know, the big crush that got me into comics. And uh, that would make me very, very happy. Um, boy, Prince Valiant, total bucket list. Uh, and I would like to do adaptations of a few novels and poems. Uh, I don't really want to name them because I don't want to spark an idea for anybody else. I certainly don't want my, my ex friend of me picking my brain. <laughs> That's a great idea, Colleen. I'm going to use that. And he did. Yay. Um, and I've got a novel I've been working on for a long time. I mean, I know everybody says this, but I've been, got a novel I've been working on for a long time and putting it off. And I want to want to get around to finish that. I, I honestly have so many ideas and goals that I just hope I live long enough to to make them. I'm starting to get paranoid about leaving the house and getting the flu. <laughs> every time I do, I guys are like, oh my God, I could have drawn a book in that time I was sick. It drives me nuts. So um yeah, I'd I'd love to draw Aquaman. I think I'd do a good job on Aquaman. And I love the character. I've always loved the character. Aquaman was my first big crush. And Prince Valiant, I met somebody who worked for 
King Feature Syndicate not too long ago. I have got to pull out their business card because they said they'd love to have me do some work on some licensing or something. I haven't followed up because I'm an idiot, a complete idiot. And I, I would just love it. Prince Valiant is my my goal of, of good artist in comics. I, I, I think Little Nemo by Windsor McKay was, was my other one, but I got to do that already. I got to do a, a short story, an animated short story with Alan Moore for an Electra Comics app, and alas and alack, you cannot access it anymore. It's It breaks my heart. It's one of my favorite pieces, some of my best work. So bummerific, but... Um, but there it is. I, I got to got to draw in the style of Windsor McKay. I think I could do an even better job now. Maybe I should pick another Windsor McKay kind of job. It's public domain, so I could do it any time. Uh, so maybe I will. So thank you for that question, Brett. That was that was lovely. Uh, let me see. Uh, Rahadian Sastrawardio has asked: Are there any painters or illustrators whose work you like? to revisit again and again. Holy cow, I have a library full. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, uh, I'm i obsessed with a few uh, few artists, uh, as you know. Um, uh, I, I keep extensive libraries, um, many, many of them, everybody from Edmund Dulac to Lion Decker, uh, to Slimuth Wolfing, to Rackham, obviously Harry Clark, Beardsley. Uh, people are always asking me, who do you like better, Harry Clark or Beardsley? And well, that's a great question. Um, I think Clark has more range. I mean, Beardsley was more original. He was the one who really came up with that look and, and style and and feel. Um, Clark took it to extremes. I mean, his work got really weird. Uh, Beardsley was the first in that department, but, but Clark had such a wide range of skills that I can't say Beardsley didn't have it. Beardsley didn't live very long. Uh, he only lived to be in his early 20s, if I recall correctly. Anyway. And uh, Harry Clark lived to be in his early 40s, so both of them were unwell, which is a darn shame. I can imagine where they would have gone. I mean, they're so great where they went, but where they would have gone, oh, tragic. But um, Harry Clark was not only an illustrator and a designer, uh, he did amazing stained glass windows, uh, which are all over Ireland. You know, a real treat to see if you ever get a chance to go to Dublin. I, I think my trip to Dublin was basically a pilgrimage to see what it was Harry Clark had done. <laughs> Running around the town going, okay, now here's where some Harry Clark windows are, and here's some Harry Clark illustrations, and here's some Harry Clark paintings, and if you're looking, they're in the Hugh Lane Gallery and they're in the National Gallery. And those two are not very far apart. I was able to walk from one to the other. Uh, it's 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 a considerable walk. I think it's a couple of miles, but um, it's a nice walk. And uh, Harry Clark all day long. I've got plenty of books on him. I, I mistook his work for Beardsley when I was a kid. And uh, later realized that the person I admired the most was actually someone else. So there you go. Um, uh, I guess in comics, George Perez was always one of my favorite cartoonists because George is not only a super nice guy, and, and you can see that coming out in his art. I mean, his art is just so jolly. And it's so full of wonderful feeling. You can tell he loves the characters he draws. But um, he was a big influence on my storytelling style. I think you can tell that in the early issues of A Distant Soil with those 11 panel pages in some cases. I was really piling it on. Um, 
book. I learned a lot from George and that includes uh, trying to give characters different faces. That was not a big thing when I was growing up. There's so much homogenization. It's not like there isn't a lot of homogenization now. I swear if, if people didn't have different hair color, I, I wouldn't know who was who in some of the comics. That, you know, the, especially with the more cartoony styles. By the way, this is not a knack. A knock. Every every time I say stylist cartoony, somebody gets offended. It's, it's not a not a knock against cartoony styles. Cartoony styles are great. They have their place. Yada yada. But uh, some of the people working in cartoony styles have have issues, and they don't differentiate the characters enough. And uh, you know that's hard uh, when you're working in simple lines and especially in some of the manga styles. A lot of people, their stuff is very homogenized. I can't tell people apart. Uh, George was, was careful to give people different noses, different body types, uh, uh, different body language. That, that made a big impression on me because that was something I was saying back in the 19, 1970s, you know, late, early 1980s. So I thought that was a pretty big deal. I can't tell you how awkward this is. Let me see if I can move this over. Oh, here we go. My my camera is right under my nose. It's on a it's on a bar right here, right under my nose. So I'm <laughs> trying to draw and talk to you at the same time without hitting the light. Uh, yesterday I had a, a different lighting set up, so I'm trying this one to see which one works better. Um, I guess this one's okay. It's a more of a white light. That's a long pen. I shouldn't be using this pen. Uh, love, love, love George Perez. Uh, Garcia Lopez. Uh, I think he's probably my bucket list goal artist to draw more like. I uh, I just think he's brilliant. He is a true draftsman. A lot of people in comic can draw, but not many people are draftsmen, and he's He's the real deal. He knows what he is doing. I adore him. Uh, I think his comic Twilight, which he did with Howard Chaikin, is is some of the best science fiction comic art ever. Um, the story is probably going to be off-putting to a lot of people. It, it takes some old characters. I guess they're Golden Age characters. I can't remember. Sorry, having a drink, uh, having a little drink of coffee there. Take some old characters, roughens them up. You know how people like to do, where they just sort of make characters really grim and gritty, and uh, they're grim and gritty in this book. And so the story may be off-putting to you or not, like that sort of thing. We don't judge, but the art is stupendous, <clears throat> and. Uh, I highly recommend it if you can check it out. It's it's absolutely gorgeous. The design work, everything about it. Oh my lord! I I can't I can't get over that book. I just think Garcia Lopez is the bee's knees. Uh, when I grow up someday, I want to be Garcia Lopez. He's also an incredible gentleman. That I do not want to grow up to be, but he is a lovely, lovely gentleman. It's such a pleasure meeting him at shows. If you ever get a chance, just go meet this wonderful man. I've, I've done shows where he's had big crowds. I've done shows where there's just nobody there. And I'm like, do you know who this is? This is Garcia Lopez. This is the greatest artist in this building. Come see the greatest artist in the building. I love that man. He is wonderful. Uh, David Mazzucchelli, um, his early work on Batman, uh, the storytelling, and it was so good, so clean. His use of black and white is wonderful. Uh, I I look back at that that issue uh, that storyline that anyway in in Batman again and again. Um, boy, I'm trying to think. Probably seems weird, but I'm having trouble coming up with artists I look at again and again. But oh, you know, Mobius, Crikey, I think I had all of his. Marvel volumes back in the 1980s. Marvel was publishing these uh, 
collections of his work through Epic. And I, I, you really need to track them down. Uh, some companies are recoloring this stuff. Uh, I, no offense whatever to the colorists who've been hired to recolor this material, but uh, I personally don't think it's an improvement. Uh, so if you want to see the original stuff, track it down, the old stuff from Marvel and DC. And um, probably sounds weird that all these books are being recolored and whatnot, but uh, my thinking is, and I know I'm right in some cases, and maybe I'm not right in other cases, but in, in many cases, uh, the negatives are gone. Uh, same thing that happened with the distant soil where uh, uh, the printer or somebody in the archives uh, ditched the negatives. Uh, I, I know for a fact many of the negatives at Le Bonfant Capricor were destroyed. So um, a lot of stuff that was published through them uh, did not make it into the modern world. So if those negatives don't exist, somebody's either got to recolor the books or do what we did on a distant soil with the digital restoration, which is being done by my uh, good man, Alan Harvey, who, in my humble opinion, is the best of the best in the business. There are so many people doing restoration these days, and nobody beats Alan. Nobody beats Alan. He takes it back to what it was in the first place. He, he just cleans it up and takes it back to what it was in the first place. He doesn't do that garish computer color that a lot of people are doing. I just, oh, it's the worst. That stuff was not meant to be colored that way. I'm, I'm sure that some comics could be colored better uh, with care and attention and a decent page rate, but a lot of the stuff that's being recolored now is, is grim, man. I, I go, holy cow, what were you thinking? Who did you hire? I, I have to assume somebody's not getting paid very well to do that stuff because... Some of that stuff looks awful. Anyway, so if you can track down the uh, original Mobius volumes from, well, either from France or from Image Epic, which doesn't exist anymore, does it? How times change. Um, but those were the best, in my opinion. Um, who else? Who is in the library back now? I used to be a big fan of Barry Windsor Smith. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to concentrate and talk to you at the same time. I cannot walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, Barry Smith, I don't, I don't know what he does these days. I don't know if he's retired or, or what. But uh, it's, it's funny that I went through a period of being a huge fan of his stuff because uh, I didn't like it when I first saw it. This, again, this is not a knock on Barry Smith. It's just my first experience with, with his stuff was his first Conan work. And, you know, I was a little kid and somebody had given me these comics and I didn't really know what they were. And I wanted Super Friends, and here was this dark, gritty guy who chopped people up with a sword, and I didn't really like it very much, so I actually threw mine away. <laughs> oh, boy, what a dope. And when I encountered his work years later, I went, who is this genius? And I was like, oh, my God. That's the stuff I threw out. Oh, Lord. So, um, I was very devoted to Barry Smith for, for many years. I don't really think my work looks that much like him, though. But, um, but I quite liked his pre-Raphaelite sense of sensibilities. There was this group of artists who put out a book called The Studio, and they all worked together, and it was... Barry Smith, oh, excuse me, Barry Windsor Smith, uh, Mike Kaluta, Bernie Wrightson, and Jeff Jones, now known as Jeffrey Catherine Jones. And um, 
they did this book called The Studio back in the 19, I don't know, late 1970s or early 1980s, I don't remember. And that was just when I was getting into to comics. And I thought, wow, this is, this is it. This is the way to live with these artists and this studio with peacock feathers attached to the wall and these cool artists around you doing these fabulous paintings and drawings and, and living the life in New York, blah, 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 blah. I didn't realize that they were all <laughs> middle-aged men by that time. I, I just thought they were kids like me. I didn't quite understand why maybe I was like 14, 15 years old or something and I couldn't draw like they did. But uh, I did eventually figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> they were my parents' age, and that uh, uh, took some of the performance pressure off, I must say, but everybody in the studio I loved. I, I loved Mike Kaluta a lot. Got quite a bit of Mike Kaluta around the office. I, I was just given as a gift by the nice people at IDW, this uh, fantastic uh, Stardust uh archive edition it's oh my god you, you gotta get this thing it's uh stupendous to see Kaluta's work this big these gorgeous comics from way back when stardust is so underrated please check it out if you can find it go dig this thing up it's amazing it's original. There was never anything like it before Stardust. There hasn't been anything like it since. It's just the most wonderful, wonderful, original, amazing book. And Elaine Lee does not get enough credit. I don't know what it is. She's, she is so smart, so funny, so clever. I just think the world of her, you, you've got to check out her stuff. Uh, again, Stardust. Please, please, please check it out. I, I preferred, again, the original coloring. It's not a knock on who's coloring it now. I'm not a, uh, just just not a big fan of that kind of color style on top of Kaluta's work. I think it's overwhelming, but that's just my opinion. Your mileage may vary. Um, I, I've been seriously thinking about ditching uh, digital color again and trying to work up another blue line color uh, approach to my stuff back in the day, back in the early days of uh, coloring comics, we would color art in a very different way than we do it now. Uh, you would get a copy of the black line art, only it would be in blue ink, and you would color on this blue ink copy and then over it would be an acetate sheet of the ink lines and you would paint on the bottom sheet and the two were melded together at the printer and uh, so you could have these really painterly effects. And, and I think the painterliness of it, uh, of the way that the art looks, is something I miss. And I tried to keep the painterliness on all of the pages in Snow Glass Apples and, and I kept flowing in and out. I, I have to say, I got to give myself props for... Uh, the way the color on that turned out. That is the first <laughs> time I've ever colored a complete job in, in, in black line art to that extent. I, I, I thought it was my first try ever, but it wasn't. I did a, a short story for um, Alex de Campany, Campy on her project Smoke and Ashes uh, in uh, black line, but I didn't do uh, it in the same way. I'd never used flatting before and and these other techniques that other cartoonists use. And I just was overwhelmed by this new process. It's not that hard when you get the hang of it, but when you're trying to take a completely different approach to the look of a job that you've, you know, you've never done before, it, it can be overwhelming. And I really let it get to me. So... Um, um, my next job, I think, I'm not sure, I'm still experimenting, is going to be uh, all analog. We shall see. Um, it's still up in the air. Uh, I'll probably make the decision in the next few weeks. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be 
analog painting. Let's see if I can pull it off. Um, so yeah, there's Barry Windsor Smith. Um, and it's funny because I used to catalog my comics not by the title of the comic, but by the by the name of the artist. I, I used to be a big fan of uh, Frank Miller. I think he peaked around the Dark Knight Returns, uh, and I thought that he was being very daring with his experiments, like Ronin, which I thought was underrated. Uh, I'm not following his work these days so much, but uh, I, I, you know, let's face it, the Dark Knight Returns was a was a game changer, and I thought the work he did on 300 was was really something. And of course, Lynn Varley was an amazing colorist. Uh, I thought she was quite overlooked. I, I I'm sure I'm not alone in in thinking that her computer coloring didn't quite stand up to the work that she was doing by hand. I mean, there are just some things that you know, some people just don't need to change anything about themselves. They, they're perfect the way they are, and I tend to think that her color, the process that she was using on 300 and The Dark Knight Returns, I, I don't really think it can be, be beat. I just thought it was beautiful. Really, really different, really unique. I'd love to see more of that someday if she ever gets back to it. Uh, so that's a few artists off the top of my head. I, I used to be really into manga. I'm not so into manga anymore. and I'm avoiding it completely. Again, somebody's going to get upset and think, oh, Colleen hates manga. That's that's not the case. I've, um, I've just decided I need to 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 step away from it. I, I, I stepped away from it like 10 years ago and haven't looked back very much. Uh, like I said, nothing against manga has nothing to do with it. It's just that I want to look at other sources, uh, other creators, and uh, find other pathways. I think that manga has become, manga as an influence has become ubiquitous, and I, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to try uh, other things, um, try other approaches. I'm looking at European art, uh, especially European comic art, a, a lot more these days, and and as much as I love line, I'm thinking more in terms of uh, line Claire instead of instead of manga styles. So that's just the way I'm going with that. Um, I don't know why. It's just every once in a while I, I have a sea change. I, I study, 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 study something, and then I go, that's enough of that, and I just switch it off, and I, I don't look back. Um, some things never, never lose their appeal, and, and some things really, really do. Um, I still like some of my old favorites. I, I have the Rose of Versailles and a couple of others in the house. And uh, just the other day, I bought Domu as a gift for Keith Giffen, who really loves Domu. Uh, he, he raves about it. He thinks it's brilliant. I was able to find him a, a copy of the graphic novel at a good price, but um, uh, I think I've explored manga for a while and I need to go other ways and so I, I haven't uh, picked up any new manga in years. I do I do still look at some anime. I, I don't look at very much, but I love Castlevania. <laughs> I think that has to do with Warren Ellis's writing and <laughs> it's hysterical it's it's so sassy <laughs> I really like it I, I didn't know what to expect I was like oh I don't know if I'm gonna like this very much I'm trying to get away from manga and then I watch it I was like ah ha ha it's hilarious so yeah Castle was pretty cool anyway let me see if I can answer one more question we're almost at 45 minutes again holy cow do I go I go through these pretty quick um Wow, let me see if I can take a short one, because all of these questions require long answers. Uh, Ray Cornwall wants to know, what are your favorite comics? Well, that's a long answer, but in the short term, 
my favorite comics. I'm not really reading very much right now because I'm doing some writing and I'm doing so much art. I, I got to get other voices out of my system. But obviously, uh, my favorite comics go back decades. And my first favorite comic, yeah, I'll do another video and get into this uh, a little more extensively later. And my camera is moving around. Sorry about that, folks. Artquake! Um, my, my original favorite comic was Adventure Comics. Uh, because that was where you could find Aquaman stories. And it was drawn by Jim Aparo. And he was one of my early favorite artists. I didn't mention him earlier, but I just love Jim Aparo's stuff. If you go through my, my files and stuff going back to when I was just getting started, uh, you'll see that I um, had a lot of Jim Aparo swipes. And I'd copy his stuff and try to learn to draw. But uh, Jim Aparo did the Spectre. Oh, those early Spectre stories were great. Oh man, and the Aquaman stories, and the Justice League. I loved the Justice League, especially the Steve Englehart era. Wow, those were some of my first comics, and I was like, well, this stuff is great, and I think it was, you know, I may be misremembering, I probably posted something 20 years ago and tells a different story, but to my memory, my first exposure to the Legion of Superheroes was in an issue of the Justice League where they had this big crossover with all the members of the Justice League and the Justice Society. And uh, it was just so cool. I was like, wow, I have to learn more about this. And one of my earliest uh, Legion of Superheroes comics... Oh, God, I'm talking about the Legion again. I just said I would talk about other things. But anyway, one of my very first Legion of Superheroes comics uh, was the wedding issue. Uh, you could get it at a grocery store. It was really hard to get comics where I lived. But they had the big tabloid comics, you know, the great big ones that were like, I don't know how big they were, 11 by 14, I guess. I don't know. I had a bunch of those. But you could you could buy those at the grocery. And you couldn't buy a lot of comics when I was growing up. You know, they were really getting hard to find. The newsstands were disappearing. And, and uh, just really hard to find for a while. But that was one of my first issues of the Legion. Uh, I, uh, the Teen Titans, the new Teen Titans. I adored it. I, I had read some Teen Titans that had been drawn by Nick Carty. And I'm not even sure where I got them. I'm not sure. I probably got them at a flea market or something. Um, but uh, I remember signing petitions to ask DC Comics to bring back the Teen Titans. How hilarious is that? When we found out that that the Teen Titans are coming back and it's going to be written by Marv Wolfman and drawn by George Perez. We were very, very pleased and flush with our own power because I guess we thought we'd had something to do with it. I have no idea. But I was in uh, an appazine called Titan Talk as well as the um, Legion of Superheroes appazine Interlac. Oh my lord. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I participated that much. I probably lurked more than I participated. They'd boot you out if you didn't <laughs> you didn't produce enough stuff. I honestly don't remember. Uh, somebody somewhere around there has my my old zine. That was back when I was a teenager. I think it was about I don't know, 16, 17, something like that. Hard to say. But the new Teen Titans are a big deal. I loved the X-Men. Uh, the Burn Era X-Men. I started reading uh, the X-Men after the death of Jean Grey. Uh, and um, it was a big influence on me. I, I think I, uh, I had a disgruntled ex-assistant who claimed that I'd snubbed him as a little high schooler and <laughs> and claimed that I was too good for him and going to go work on the X-Men, which is absolute bunk because uh, we're the same age, so I definitely wasn't snubbing him as a little high schooler. And I didn't read the X-Men in high school. I, I'd never read a single issue. 
No, I was not snubbing him to go work on a comic book I never read. Um, I thought that was hilarious. Uh, but, you know, people tell stories. Bye, dude. My career's better than yours. Good luck. Anyhow, um, I, I love the Burn Era X-Men, and uh, I'm not sure, but I think... I started reading it around, like, after the funeral or something. I, I, well, it had to be after the death of Jean Grey, otherwise they wouldn't have had the funeral. But I, I just can't recall the exact moment. I, I keep thinking it's uh, the funeral, but it may have been that I got the funeral issue later as, as a catch-up. I do remember that I read... X-Men, God Loves, Man Kills, and that was one of the earliest, earliest stories I read. But I loved John Byrne's stuff, and he went to some lengths to try to get his comics, his back issues, and they were you know, pretty hard to get, and few retailers in the area were kind of jacking up the prices, so if you were a kid like me trying to get old comics on the cheap you, you weren't having much luck but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I didn't start reading X-Men until college so I was not dismissing my ex-assistant dude as a little high schooler that guy's really pissed off because I <laughs> fired him for lying he uh, hired him to work for me as an assistant and then he pulled a Tom Sawyer on me and hired a bunch of other people to do the work and, and then didn't pay them. They showed up at a convention angry with me, wondering where their money was. And I was like, I don't, <laughs> I don't even know who you are. <laughs> One of them uh, uh, has given me permission to write about this on my Patreon. I haven't gotten around to writing about it, but it's a hilarious story. And then I found out years later that this guy had actually been forging my stuff as well to sell at a convention since back in the 1980s and what do you know decades later uh, some of the forgeries showed up on eBay <laughs> and I had to get into it with an art dealer about how he was selling forgeries of my stuff and he, his wife got really pissed at me <laughs> it was hilarious so we have this exchange of letters that are epic and I should save them for my autobiography, I guess. They're pretty funny. That ex, ex assistant could tell some whoppers. He is a professional artist now, but boy, did he have a dubious start. Um, his uh, former assistants told me that he actually got a job by putting uh, pages of mine in his portfolio with <laughs> samples. What a jerk. What a jerk. Oh, God. Anyway, so let me see. What were some of my other favorite comics? Um, I was doing a lot of comics reading in the 1980s. Oh, man, I loved <laughs> Son of Satan. <laughs> I loved that comic. It was so cool. I, I don't remember where I found it. I can't remember if I... It was one of those comics that were given to me as a gift when I was sick, when I was like 12 years old. Somebody gave me a bunch of these old books, or if I found it in the back issue bin or something. I don't remember, but I thought they were the coolest things, and they were so so dark and subversive. And the art was great. I thought there was, uh, there was some early inks by P. Craig Russell on those, and he did a beautiful job. Uh, I think they were a pretty big influence on me. Craig Russell was a big influence on my stuff early on. Um, I, I say he's, I, I think I was saying for a long time he wasn't an influence on me because I just hadn't looked at his stuff in a long time. But, you know, I have to say that the early stuff was, the later stuff not so much, but the early stuff was. And um, I do think our art resembles one another, but I think it's more we're, you know, mining the same ore than anything else. Um, we have a lot of the same influences, and so we're going in a lot of the same directions. But I do remember that... These early issues of Son of Satan were a big deal for me. <laughs> they, they didn't influence my religious beliefs or anything, but I thought they were really cool and really dark and 
and creepy and wonderful and, and some of the art was fantastic especially the last issue issue eight by russ heath hands down one of the most gorgeous comics ever it was so beautifully drawn you can get it for a song if you if you really want to to see a mighty finely drawn comic book track down this puppy it is stupendous really really original and amazing especially for a 1970s era comic i can't believe they got away with some of the stuff they got away with in that book it was, it was pretty awesome uh, and it's not very expensive. I think it's more expensive now because you know, they keep reviving the character and now he's getting his own TV show, which God knows what that's going to be like. But, <laughs> you know, Lucifer is, you know, the Lucifer TV show is way off the, way off the original, but I, I like it. I think it's a hoot. I get a real kick out of it. Anyway, so those are some of my favorite comics. And I'm about to run on a whole hour uh, video again and you actually got to see me draw this time this is just so slow and tedious I don't know if this is any fun for you guys I, I hope you you enjoy watching this stuff uh, but I'm sure it's like watching paint dry I don't know if it's very edifying to see me sit here and do this stuff so you know you're my patrons you get the say uh, I might put this one on YouTube I haven't decided uh, but you guys get first crack. Anyway, um, ask me more questions. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about what I'm drawing. You want me to talk more about the drawing or more about the art or whatever. That's all for today. Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to get back to work on this and have some tea and sandwiches. And you guys have a good one. Bye-bye.